beings freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world. Such a beautiful last statement <coughs> that is given there in the verses, which are purely, almost you can see, as a taking up as a gradual teaching, which are leading us to uh, much, uh, much to development in our own practice. And so with this uh, development of uh, goodwill to oneself, and then rating that outwards to others, then in return we will increase our own goodwill to ourselves. Or if we have compassion for others, and this then will then turn inwards to have compassion understanding for ourselves. So this is the two ways that we can see how metta is uh, ready and mature for both practitioners. One who has self-hatred, and for the other one who has uh, ill will and animosity to others more than oneself. So if one has much inner self-hatred, then it's advisable to consider kindness and compassion to other people's suffering so one can understand one's own suffering and despair. And this, I myself... Uh, can uh, see that it's very true. When I went to visiting, traveling as a young man to third world countries, it totally changed my outlook towards myself because it forced me to have compassion to others, forced in a situation where I could not run away from. And uh, also recently, looking after my elderly mother who was terribly sick, also again forced me to look at myself very deeply because uh, one has to uh, think about others totally in some situation environments. And this brings so much maturity. That's why uh, women in general are very good at uh, calming, calming a, a heated environment. Their, their energy is well, well appreciated because of their kindness and caringness and motherly attention that they have which they naturally are inclined to because of their great sacrifice they make. Bearing a child and raising that child is an extremely great sacrifice that uh, us males can never understand. It's uh, have such a powerful experience. So, uh, or on the other case where we have much uh, uh, concerned about uh, we're not so much having hatred for ourselves, then, uh, then we, want to, we want to increase our, 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 our radiance towards others. Is in other ways, is uh, increasing our sense of wellness, well-being, and then directing it to others by developing more goodwill that's already established and easy to do. So really, a lot of Ajans do teach, you know, first have metta for yourself, but that that is another thing about Dharma practice. One has to have the mind and recognize one's mind where it's at in, in the sense of as a human being here and now on earth, um, emotionally, uh, intellectually, and uh, physically as well, age and uh, social conventions that one is accustomed to. And looking at that deeply and looking at Dharma as a basis which is timeless. So it's, it applies to all of us. And we can look at it deeply in Dharma. How does it relate to me? What Dharmas that are really important to my life? For example, a lot of people are attracted to Mahayana teachings because of the great compassion, such as Thich Nhan's, uh, uh films and clips and YouTube uh, sites of some great Mahayana teachers. And they teach predominantly compassion very kind, compassionate, wherefore Theravada tends to be more wisdom-based, more intellectual, dry approach. So a lot of people are attracted to different teaching styles because of what their needs are. And this is the beauty what the Lord Buddha's aim was in the very beginning of the sasana, when the first uh, 80 to 60 Aryas who were first in, interested, inter, introduced into the world, particularly there was, I think, about 60 which are of, by the cause of Yasa, Gulabut, famous Yasa Seti millionaire, 
and all his great associated friends were the, were the bulk of the, the 60 to 80 first Sāvakas when after they were established, all Arahants, the Lord Buddha, then asked them to go each in different directions, no two monks going, and they travelled very far. It was recorded some went to Thailand, Sri Lanka, to China. They didn't just stay in India, they went very far, Pakistan, and they established Sasana there. So because of that, these different cultures then evolved, Buddhism evolved, depending on that culture, the customs of those countries, because it suffused it with Buddhism. That's why we have such a rich Buddhist teachings in the world where a lot of people confuse. They say, well, Theravada teaches this, Mahayana teaches this. Where, where, I'm so confused, Ajahn. What, what should I follow? Follow your heart. Follow where you have faith and conviction in. This is the most important message of Lord Buddha, is that like you're attracted to this centre here. A lot of people are attracted to... Uh, Tibetan centers or, you know, you know um, uh, uh, Mahayana centers. But a lot of Westerners do really appreciate Theravadan treatings because they are much more practical, less ritual-based, and much more um, dealing with really important, you know, daily issues or problems that are, you know, that they can relate into their own lives. So I myself feel, likewise, I feel very attracted to Theravadan teachings and the wealth of, and we are the most luckiest because we have the most intact, pristine collection of Buddha Vachana, which all the other traditions do use as a resource pool, like a library. So that's wonderful to see that we're preserving something which is supporting other traditions to practice as well. And they can freely do, you know, this is because this is what the Lord Buddha asks, go out in eight directions so forth. So uh, on an occasion now, uh, I wanted to uh, just talk about uh, something from the suttas which I found very uh, uh, interesting, which uh, hardly, I feel, doesn't get talked much with lay people because they feel it's more to do with monks and that's sensual pleasures. Since, you know, a lot of people say, oh, sensual pleasures, like, even in our Buddhist teachings, there is, uh, we do encourage lay people to get joy from material wealth and uh, the joy of being not in debt and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so forth, and uh, <coughs> where they are developing good virtuous conduct, uh, developing uh, wisdom aspects, but the, 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 the aspect of samadhi is, is withdrawn to a greater extent to the laity because they don't have time for that practice. And so uh, one of the largest obstacles to uh, concentration is that of sensuality. So and this is why the Lord Buddha did, did not say that people can't practice samadhi practice or concentration, but they just don't have enough time and this takes time and much. It's, just, it's a very gradual process, deepening the mind and the getting unity of the mind. Or as the Lord Buddha said, equanimity that's based on unity, not equanimity that's based on diversity, meaning that all of us can experience a neutrality state, but from that neutrality state, we go and experience, uh, let's say, for example, we're lying in our bed, we're tired, we're feeling sleepy, and then well, first we were in a neutral state, and then we're aware we're sleepy, and then, you know, oh, I'll, I'll feel asleep. We incline to whatever mood or feeling that arises and go to that. So then when there's no mood, feeling, or anything, the mind is naturally in a neutral state. It's only when there's an object that has arisen that in the presence whereof that changes our base of our mind to go to that object. So, for example, if you're uh, feeling quite easy, going happy-go-lucky, and you're going to work, and you're walking down the street, and uh, suddenly uh, the garbage has been taken out. There's all these terrible smells, you know, and you just go, oh, it's just terrible. Like I know in Thailand when we go Bindabad, the, the amount of garbage, in, you know, because now there's a lot of modern, modern sort of like, you know, look, people don't use recycle a lot in the, a lot of the poorer countries and sort of, you know, garbage left out. It's not so well organised like it is in the West. So the rubbish really smells. So you go for a kilometre, you can smell it. The stench is just terrible. It can really just wreak havoc on your mind. You go, oh, it's all gut-wrenching. And, 
and uh, so uh, so it's and I we see it as again for monks we see it as good mindfulness practice just to that, or or there might be another situation someone um, upsets you and you take on that up you feel very upset, and again your mind is lost its base of neutrality, and it might take you half a day to come back to being calm again. But this is uh, one of the aims of the Lord Buddha, is to train very well in mindfulness as much as possible. So when these things that happen that, uh, that make our mind uh, become biased, to become angry, upset, things like that, then we can see that happening, that process. So Lord Buddha said that people of the world don't need samadhi to have panya. Okay? So there's a wrong view there that, you know, a lot of teaching saying, oh, I need to have deep samadhi, then with that samadhi use panya, and then I can see a nicha, dukkha, and anatta. But that's not the case. The Lord Buddha says that panya can be developed on, on even on uh, someone who's just got, you know, uh, you know, you know, reasonable virtuous conduct and re- reasonable amount of level of mindfulness. One can start from there and develop wisdom straight away. So, uh, and this is uh, from a practical basis of experiencing and learning and teaching oneself to understand that uh, what we're experiencing uh, is not something we should uh, to hold on to. Like last night I was at Keysborough Temple teaching a large audience and I was also working on this theme of the sense basis and I got the five four kids to line up the front and i gave them all different objects of the senses and the first round was they were just sitting there very unmindfully because i didn't tell them to be mindful just said sit there relax so they're all sitting very sloppy and they, and they all reacted you know like there was one jar with manure and they went oh that stinks that's terrible they really went over the top and there was a an old flower and they go oh yuck you know and we were, had that on the camera so all the people could see that and then and then I asked to talk about it and uh, how to affect them, their minds, and they, they, they were quite altered. They, you know, they talked their relationship to that recognition of that object. Now this sounds really like very simple, one plus one equals two. Oh, Arjan, come on, I know about this. But there's another layer which we don't see, which I was trying to point out, something very obvious, and that is that we should learn to recognize the neutral state of the mind where it hasn't changed or altered. It's in a neutral state. It's not gone to any, uh, uh, no, no sense of somana uh, sadomana, uh, as a little bit of says, going to grief or sadness or going to uh, a lofty joy, happiness, elated, but in a state of neutrality. It's just saying, oh yeah. And when we're in this state, we normally don't like that state. And what we normally refer to that equanimous state is boring this is boring and that's what hides it covers up and destroys our mindfulness but if we were to acknowledge okay i'm bored and this is what our society is more and more generating this sense of i'm bored i'm fed up with the world so without any further ado we will play our first video well in shady glade prince siddhartha began to sit in meditation attaining the tranquility of the first jhana. As the afternoon passed by, the shadows of all the trees moved with the course of the sun, except for the shade of the rose apple tree under which the prince sat. It did not shift position, but remained steadily in place. When the companions returned and saw this wonder, they were startled and conveyed the news to the king who went to see for himself. When my son was newly born, Asita the hermit came to look at him, and to my surprise he bowed at my son's feet. On that day, I also bowed to my son for the first time. Now, my son has performed this marvel. Having seen it, I feel I must bow to him for a second time. So I just wanted to show show that short footage. Uh, So inspiring that even a young child of maybe 
or the, as as a Prinsadatta, the Bodhisattva, the Buddha to be, uh, Gautama, the Buddha. Uh, he, at that young age, uh, had a very very wholesome mind, even from a very very young age. As we can say, his parami levels, his uh, virtuous qualities were very high, and we can see that when some young children, they never get angry, they don't, they don't, you know. They're generous. They don't, you know, think about themselves. They think about others. Very, we're almost thinking, well, it's so advanced. I remember I have one relative like that, a young child, has always praised him. Said, well, he's not like a normal child. This young man, he'd be very good. He'll come into the world. He'll do something very good in the world. I feel. And so we really appreciate people like that. And when we meet people like that, it gives us inspiration. But we've got to remember ourselves. You know, don't feel bad about ourselves if we're not there yet. But that's to show you the potential of this human mind, that we all can achieve that. It's just a matter of time. The Lord Buddha says it's a gradual training and being like the sea as we enter the ocean is very shallow and it gets deeper and deeper. So too, as we continue our Dharma practice, it gets deeper and deeper and our experience of Dharma to ourselves becomes more profound and so forth. So this is uh, the thing not to, uh, not to uh, forget about this. So as I was talking about sensuality, the main theme I wanted to discuss was that, uh, that what distracts us the most is uh, not, not our ideas. We think it's all our ideas, our meditating is not work going so well, you know, thinking about this, thinking about that. But it's our daily, day, daily attitude, day in, day out, moment to moment, which makes up the whole day, is what really we, we are, we're not really looking at. And we think, oh, I don't have hot time much. I'm really busy with my work and things like that. But, uh, but I mean, um, <clears throat> if you're, for example, going uh, uh, to the to the uh, to the train station or going waiting in, the, in a, on the train going to work, that's also can be used for meditation or contemplation or times when you have to wait. There's always periods of time where you're actually, you know. You've got nothing to do, and a lot of people use their get the phone out and they're play, playing with their phone, and that's a good good. Not saying that's bad, you know. Like you know, if you have work to do on your phone, that's of course needed. But but when we when we start using these devices just to fill up our lives, it becomes it grows and grows. They take more and more of our time, and uh, the more we invest in, the more they seem to be more important. Like we had a group of young men coming to the monastery and, uh, and I said how they were going, you know, and they were just coming into nearly ready for higher ordination and I said, oh, oh, uh, you know, it's, it's so tough letting go of my phone, letting go of my mobile phone, oh, so tough because, you know, they had to put it in a bag and, you know, oh, so tough. Every day I was just missing my phone so bad. It was like, you know, forget about my friends, my phone. I can't go about my phone. <laughs> It's not, you know, my mum or dad are missing. They were saying, that's the person missing their phone, not a human being, but this phone. So it's like a, an, an extension of ourselves, who we are. We put so much identity of ourselves in that phone. And again, this is uh, what we call killet mark. It's like, you know, really the defilements are just wreaking havoc. They're really, uh, really just, uh, really just, uh, if you let them, they'll just run amok in your mind. And so with this phone is, is uh, the fact, the real fact is um, it's working on two levels, working on auditory and visual. These are the most two powerful areas that uh, we can experience our day-to-day -day living. So, for example, Lord Buddha uh, did say that uh, furnish endowed with the five objects of sensual pleasure, with forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agree agreeable and pleasing and tantalizing, with sounds heard by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable and pleasing, with odours smelt by the nose that are wished for, desired, agreed and pleasing, tantalising, and with taste tasted by the tongue that are and agreeable and tantalising, with object or tactile objects touched by the body that are wished for, desired and pleasing and uh, tantalising. And so connected with sensual pleasure, these things, what do you think, isn't, isn't this amusement more more a more sublime, he would say, you know, he'd say for, for those who uh, don't know anything else, you know, this is like the, 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 the prima donna of, that's as good as it's going to get. It's like someone saying, now you're in this world as a human being, that's good as going to get. 
your enjoyment through these five senses, that's as good as it's going to get. If that was a case, then, uh, then uh, there would be no Dharma in the world. But the Lord Buddha says that, uh, that desires themselves um, are very limiting and uh, the, the, uh, the pleasure uh, is very little that one can gain from it. But the stress and the suffering and the danger is, is very great. And he was even mentioning this to householders as well, not just to monks. So what he was encouraging just for the laity is also to attain sotapanna at least. At the time of the Buddha Sasana, he was trying to get the lay people up so that they would at least get to the stage of sotapanna. Many did from listening to his discourses or, or practicing according to what he was asking them to do and they had much faith and confidence. So again, they maybe had a lot of paramis, a lot of development already over, over many lifetimes. This is how we understand it. Even the Lord Buddha talks about that. It's not just something in one life, it's ongoing. Even himself, as being a Lord Buddha, it was for many eons he was developing the paramis and those qualities to become a Buddha. So uh, this is, uh, it doesn't just come out of nowhere, Dharma practice. It's something that we've got to develop, cultivate. <coughs> so with those... Uh, these uh, sensual impingements, as we can say, what they, uh, we, we just naturally get lost in them and they promote pramad and heedlessness. And this is one of the natural things that they promote, which I did with these children last night. Uh, then I got them, after showing that video, I got them to sit again very mindfully. And they were young Sri Lankans, so they know they sit meditation because they practice meditation. They go to Sunday school, so they know about Dharma. Straight away, they sit all oh, very beautifully, mindfully. Then we did the test again. And again, they didn't know what. And the, and the results were incredible. I almost popped my eyes out. The, 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 the restraint and the composure did not get altered, whatever they were given. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they experienced it. And then I was very, and I said, it's like you didn't experience anything at all. You know? I says, no, I did, Arjun. Oh, what did you experience? Oh, it was, it was manure. Um, and it's, um, I think it was a buffalo manure. She even went to the point analyzing what is this smell? What is this dirty smell? Instead of going, oh, yeah, ugh, I don't want to like. She asked, what is it? She looked at it and analyzed it. I thought that was great. She was only, you know, like 12 or 13, the very fact. So, I mean, this sounds, oh, Arjun, this sounds really silly, you know, come on, you know. But even then, what we've got to look at, what's this pointing at, is that consciousness is another important, very important thing that the Lord Buddha said. Consciousness needs an object to arise. So if it doesn't have an object, consciousness does not arise. So, for example, suddenly if you hear a loud noise, bang, consciousness arises there. And uh, it's constantly arising and passing away. And so what, what we really are working with most of the time is memory. Memory of a situation. So, for example, if we're, if we're uh, you know, walking down a street, we know that street very well, it's memory, you know. And then, uh, you know, and then we, uh, you know, so it's, it's funny, we can do, like, test for ourselves. We walk down some place um, and just see if we, uh, we see something and see if it was there in exactly the same pace, place. And then we, we don't realise, oh, they moved that. And maybe the next time we walked down the street, we didn't really saw that because we're just so used to, saying that's there, you know, like, like for example, someone's selling their, their little uh, water buggy. And uh, if I was to walk down that street and I was in memory, it wasn't there, I wouldn't even realise it's not there. I would just say it's there. My mind would put it there because it's, it's used to it being there. But when we have self-awareness, we straight away see oh, it's not there. And so too. So then once we, we establish more mindfulness in the present moment, then we can see these objects, how they, they change our base from, from a neutral state to liking and disliking. And this is quite important. And thus, conduct of a fool, as the Lord Buddha said uh, in my own, uh, my own contemplation of what the Lord Buddha's meaning there is, thus foolishly directed into seeking unwholesome sensual pleasures that are prerogative of lust. Now, I didn't use that word before I said tantalizing, but this is what it does. It builds up lust. Lust, in a sense, people usually say, oh, he's talking about sex now. But that's not the case. The Lord Buddha in the time, the Pali, as we understand it, is that it's a, it's a strong emotional desire, a strong craving. So it can be of that, what I just mentioned, or it can be of other objects as well. 
And so, but we can, if we look at ourselves, we can see, yes, it does have that effect. And, uh, and you can see that, uh, it, for example, recently there was on the, on these, um, on, the, on, the, on the phone recently, there was footage in these news clips of a man going around killing all these emus in South Australia, which was horrendous. It was in the you know, front page of the paper. He was going around, he was filming himself hitting all these emus. And, and you, you observe his face in that footage. He is totally, totally just, uh, totally a mind, just in a, in a way sort of happy. It's sort of like a happy cruelty. And this is what the Lord Buddha said is one of the aspects of the mind that, uh, that goes to the level of cruelty, that it's, that it's pleasurable. There's a, that's, the, that's the sad thing, that one can achieve a sense of pleasure. And one can remember, let's say, for example, when we were young at school and if we were bullied or, or if we were in a gang, we bullied someone, we can remember the pleasure in that, hurting or harming someone, making fun or pinning them. This is like a power, you know, it's a power trick. We can get up like a pleasure from that or, you know, putting, self, you know, putting someone down or something like that. So again, this is again the danger when these experiences that we experience is that we make a big deal about them to the point where we, where we break our virtuous qualities and they break into a speech or some action which the Lord Buddha said was unadvisable to do. And then later this man, then, then uh, later, on a later date, uh, was very remorseful what he did. Not because someone said, you did wrong, he was remorseful. And this shows that Dharma is correct and true, like the Buddha says. If we do an unwholesome action, regardless if we, uh, we know about Dharma or not, the mind, the natural Dharmic effect on the mind is that it will bring uh, somanasa as an ending result. Because this is the law of Dharma, is that when we do something very unwholesome, regardless if we have, even if we feel we're right doing it, later we'll have remorse. So this is what we have to, why did that happen? We say, it happened so quickly. Why did I get angry, all of that? It's because our day-to-day life as we're living moment to moment, we're not acknowledging this neutral state, this neutral state of knowingness that is we consider boring. But if we look at it very deeply, there's a hidden layer there waiting to be found and discovered. And so this takes time and maturation of the mind, not easily swayed. So uh, this is a very important note. So I use that example of that man because uh, it was very important. And now we'll play the uh, second video, which is to show if we are just indulging in sensuality a lot, then we'll have this feeling of also boredom. And this one's a very good one. This is what led to Yasa, one of the very famous arahants of the first Savakas. To uh, to seek to seek a, seek truth to seek truth why his dilemma of life. Actually, these women are not so attractive at all. My father built me three mansions, one for each season of the year. He hired beautiful maidens to play music and entertain me. I thought I was living a happy life, but now I feel tired of this way of life. Is this all I came into this world for? Are these the only things that can give one happiness in life? Then. Why do I feel so bored and fed up? How troubled I feel. How frustrated. So I won't go into the next scene, because the next scene he's, uh, he's getting uh, Dharma teachings from the Lord Buddha. So uh, and that's uh, where he uh, changes his way to uh, thing. So uh, uh, his way of practice and the way of understanding of the world uh, shifted totally in him. So I have wanted to uh, just show uh, some just important points of just first the potentiality of 
uh, peace and calm and serenity and the potential for one to seek a way out, one not happy with this, this nature of life. So this is what we call nibbita. So this is what really seeds and fuels our dharma practice, a sense of uh, not just boredom, but there's something more deeper. We usually boredom, what that state of mind, boredom, what it motivates us is to find distraction, to find something to do, to entertain ourselves. But there's another level of boredom which we call in the Buddha's teaching nibbita, where there's like burnay, and they say in Thai, and that is where we feel it's a hopeless, this, this life. We feel like how hopeless it is. What a lost cause. It's such a tragedy. Everything is such, we see things quite tragically, you know, in a very sort of like, in a melancholy way, you know, sort of. And uh, this is quite good if we cultivate it to, to look deeply at our lives with Dharma, because then this will help us to come to an understanding that we can, uh, too, uh, transcend uh, these obstacles or difficulties or this dissatisfaction with our state of affair and go to explore ourselves on another deeper level. And this will bring, um, this, because of that uh, nibbita, that peril, that dispassion, that's also a very high dharma. It starts from a very early beginning, but also ends near vimuti, near, near the point, moment where the mind does awaken, to awaken a certain level of uh, maybe sotapanna or sakigami or so forth. It will, again will happen very strongly. So I myself felt that very strongly uh, quite a long time ago, and, and uh, it was a powerful experience, this Nibbita. And uh, it, really, uh, uh, it really has that feeling seeking to undo, un unconstruct this, this, this suffering, this, this state of dissatisfaction, you know. Neither sensual pleasure nor suffering have the answer, and this is what the Lord Buddha says, is because of our untrained mind, how we receive these data is pretty much uh, we're, we're, at, it's, uh, we're at the mercy of it. You know, it's normal that we have an experience of like, that we, we go to that. It's normal we have an experience of dislike, we go that way. And that's what I did with these children, showing these things, like we had one paper, this sandpaper, and we roughed it, it was very rough, and then it had a feather. And they all, and they, and they, and they, the, through the meditation, they said, I felt something rough. It was sandpaper, I think. And, says, and I asked him, did, did you feel aversion to it? He says, no, I was interested. I want to know more about it. And that's beautiful, not afraid. That's the state of the mind that's buoyant and mindful. It doesn't react to the situation. It's interested to what is happening, even if it's displeasurable. It's interested because it wants to look into it. It wants to look into it and discover the truth of that. What is it that's, that's making, creating delusion in the mind? So we're undoing these delusions in the mind, and when we see that as it is in its nature, then the mind naturally goes to a deep peace because it's, because it's letting go of kilesa, getting go of the defilements. When the mind does let go of some defilement, what is a result of that? Uh, you get peace, as Lumpur Cha would say. If you give, if you let go a little bit, you get a little bit of peace. If you let go a lot, you get a lot of peace. So this is a, a powerful statement that uh, Lumpur Cha would say uh, many on many occasions. And again, the Lord Buddha also stated that engaging in sensual pleasures without sensual perceptions, sensual desires, and thoughts of sensuality—that's impossible. So here, what he's referring to is the engagement of them. And says, you know, people usually say sensual pleasure, always oh, talking about sex, but that's not what actually Lord Buddha is pointing at because he goes for the five, five, five things of sensuality. And this is, uh, we should see, that is the basis of that. Of course, procreation is, is a very fundamental, powerful aspect for all beings, and we can't deny that. But there's all these other aspects as well of our life, how we enjoy our life, how we seek to enjoy it. So if we can... It's not saying that we can now have to be miserable, not enjoy our, our lives, but what, what we're looking at is that contact brings, what, brings about feeling. And there's three kinds of feelings. There's pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feeling. Thus, they give rise to various shades of desires. And do we recognize what desires give rise to? And this is the big question we have to ask ourselves. And this is where we miss the mark all the time and where the mind naturally goes 
to distraction, the state of distraction. If it can be, the, if there was a, a fourth uh, category for unwholesome uh, groups, such as there's the three main ones, which is greed, hatred, and delusion, the fourth one would be uh, distraction, the state of uh, careless attention, where the mind is not able to focus, pay attention, to observe it in a very natural state, what it is, which is naturally, most of the time, it's in an equanimous state, unless an object arises that then creates an issue for the mind to then uh, express uh, as it does. So, uh, so with this object that we can see that, that I was saying about, uh, thus uh, all these desires, we can say, give rise to many different shades, you know, so very uh, different, different shades of, you know, happiness, excite, excitement, uh, 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 and so forth. But w do we recognize that that desire gives rise to, uh, uh, to that which we cling to? And this is the most important thing, is that uh, if, there was, if there wasn't this step away from desires, then there would be no chance for us to actually change our experience as it is. But there is. <laughs> And I've seen it in my own practice when something strong, you know, uh, object or something, you see desire rise. And then we can see that and then see with mindfulness what will happen next. When the mind is mindful, if you let go of your mindfulness, you let go, you see, you can do a test yourself, you can see. When you let go of your mindfulness, you see the mind make a whole story around that and then build up a whole scenario around that. It's like, uh, you know, for example, you know, kids like ice cream. You know, you say to them, oh, you know, tonight we're having ice cream. We're going to have your favourite gelati. And straight away they're thinking about, I oh, can't wait to tonight, can't wait. They make a big story about it. They're thinking about that. And that's a classic example, just mentioning it. Desire rise, oh, we're going to have ice cream, great. And, and in, in, the, in the monks training in the, uh, in the monastery, sometimes like that, like the Ajahn, the great Ajahns, they'll see if, the, if some monks have got a lot of desire for something, they'll take it off the table. <laughs> what did that, that's the ice cream that was offered. No, no, give it to the lay people. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what did that mean? That's the ice cream. <laughs> all week, because, you know, Sunday's a big day in... in poor monasteries, that's when all the people come, you know, maybe some more rich people, and they offer very nice gifts, and the agent says, no, we're not having that, they give that to lay people. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really good training. You just really see, and you think, why did he do that? And you think, why did he do that? Oh, he was showing my mind. He was showing my mind. And uh, so, uh, and that's the, the, the beauty is when we, uh, we are put in that environment where we are forced to train as monks. We can really see that. And we can share that with lay people. So I can share that. And we can do our own, own tests, you know, uh, with ourselves. You know, we're gonna, you know, for example, tonight I'm going to have my favourite food. And then you just say, no, I'm not going to have it. Just do that. Put it in the fridge. See how you feel. See how much you'll be thinking, oh, I've got to have that. I can't even What are you putting in the fridge? You can do it yourself, just as in a test. Just do it. You don't have to torture yourself or day in, day out. But just to see that mind, how it does. There is desire, but desire is not the problem. It's the attachment that we're looking at. And that which brings uh, bhava, this quality of me. I am me. I am born in this world. I ex bhava means becoming, becoming. I exist. I am born in this world. I experience, I experience. It's all about me, 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 I, and my, what, what, as I am now. And bhava, conditions jati, which is the consciousness, and this is how I like to interpret it, paticca samapada, is moment to moment. This is one that's the controversial way of teaching it. So I haven't gone through the whole series of link. I've just started from, from uh, contact. And this is very important. This is what the most important area of paticca samapada that we can know and work with. The other areas, is so refined. It's someone, someone who's got very high level of meditation could actually uh, uh, comprehend it and work with that, because it's working on just the mechanics of the engine. You know, so oh, you know that's the flywheel. That's that. That's that. You know, but that's not your reality. The reality is that you know the engine's on. You know, the, it's the foot pedal. You know, so you want to work with that reality. What is for you day to day? And the Lord Buddha says this is a very excellent area to work with. From contact, feeling, desire, attachment becoming. 
this area. And then we can reverse it because we have this recognition of, of um, desire arising. This, this is where we work. It's not feeling. Feeling is something we know, and it's feeling is where we make it, where we decide how we feel about it. For example, let's say someone's into sadomasochism, you know, you know, and someone isn't, you know, they'll get off on that being, you know, hit. Where someone doesn't, they're saying, well, you know, well, you're you're kinky, you've got, you know, you're, you know, whatever. So that's a classic example where 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 this sensuality has been twisted around to find this kind of. Uh, I don't want to say perverted because it might offend some people into that, but this kind of uh, different way of take on it, and, and, that's, and that's what they, they get, get on it. But it basically it is, when people are playing with sensual pleasure, it's the danger of the law, but it says when we are trying to create some environment for it, we actually are disturbing the mind more and more. It's not bringing any real happiness. It's actually bringing more suffering. So that's the danger law, but it says when we indulge in sensuality, even though it's great, we get a big hit out of it, but there's a real danger. There's a, there's a withdrawal systems afterwards. There's a sense of, oh, you know, well, that's a real, you know, now. Because you can never satisfy them. This is what the law Buddha says, because it's something so fleeting and permanent, and that's what creates us so hard to make it otherwise, because we can't stand it. So, uh, and this is where we where we can resolve the problem going back to our neutral state of mind and increasing that understanding of equanimity and neutrality and enjoying that refined kind of happiness where it's not good, it's not bad, it's just, yeah, so what? But enjoying that, enjoying that because there's no, there's no um, vipaka karma in that. That's what the Lord Buddha says. There'll be no remorse, no regret, no ups and downs and moods. It'll be more even. So uh, I'll just stop now because I think I've uh, I've left it to the end to go. I could have gone a bit more deeper on this uh, this aspect of des desire and attachment. But what I wanted to say is that finally, that once once feelings arise and we recognise whatever feelings we have, then we can just uh, observe them and just see what comes from that. Usually, some desire, a liking or disliking, and so forth, and then we can recognise that. And if we have sila then we, we're, we're working with remaining a, a boundary around how we, exp how we express those feelings. And that's what the whole idea of sila is about, to support the mindfulness. If we don't have the sila, then we can't support mindfulness. And therefore, then we result in uh, much uh, vipaka karma because of a lack of what I was saying before, pramad, this heedless behavior. And that is all... And one of the most important ones is lacking hiriotapa, you know, which is a sense of uh, 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 shying away from doing something unwholesome and the dread, the consequences of that, and trying to encourage them because they are bright states. The Lord Buddha says if we have this quality of uh, hiriotapa, you know, shyness to do something wrong, which we normally do in societies, but when we're alone, it's different, you know. We behave, we, we're like Dr. Jekyll. When we're in, in public, we behave a certain way. But when we're alone, right, no one's watching. I can now just, you know, let go. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, whatever people do in, in, their, in a private time. And that is somewhere we have to look. That is that we're trying to increase a very refined for that happiness and stability of the mind, mental health. We're looking at that in a very deep level because our society is just promoting so much uh, confusion and agitation where, where, where that's... It's like, when's the next hit? When's the next excitement? When's the next big, you know, thing I'm going to, you know, get off on? And this is, uh, this is quite addictive as well. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet. I've, I've, I did a bit of uh, research and I thought it's quite a dangerous device if one who doesn't have a level of integrity, one... And they've got a new thing on the internet called incognito. Like, you can just go and no one will know. And that's, what's that saying? It's like... like He's like saying, everyone says to you, you can do what you want. We won't criticize you at all. <laughs> we'll just turn around. <laughs> so, uh, so therefore, we have to develop our own sense of witnessing ourselves. Because if that's another beauty of mindfulness. It'll help us witness ourselves, what we've done, and therefore we can grow from that and change. Yeah.